All right, guys. Hi, welcome back. Um, so here's our next little mini lecture on biological membranes from chapter five. Um, this talk is going to be about passive transport. So up to this point, you should be pretty comfortable with the structure of a plasma membrane, the characteristics of phospholipids, how they arrange themselves in a bilayer, um, embedded proteins, whether they are membrane um, integral or peripheral proteins, and uh, transport proteins. So if you don't feel you're comfortable with those topics yet, you might want to hold off on watching this and go back and review those topics because now we're going to actually do stuff with these phospholipid bilayers and transport proteins. So if you're ready, let's get going. Okay, so first, the, these two um, transport lectures that I'm going to be covering, one is called passive transport and one is called active transport. The words for those active and passive are directly related to whether the cell uses energy to transport particles or substances, whatever, across its membrane. If it does not use energy, like it's not burning ATP or any other cellular energy, it's what we call passive transport. If the cell does use cellular energy, like usually the form of ATP, to move something across a membrane, we call that active transport. So this module is just going to be covering the passive, no energy needed passive transport, okay? So one of the first terms we have to understand about phospholipids is this idea of call, what's called selective permeability or sometimes it's called semi-permeable. It means the membrane does not allow everything to cross it there. It's like a, a gatekeeper. It prevents certain things from coming through, but allows other things to go through. So I have two kind of diagrams, a little bit one more cartoony and one that's a little bit more realistic. So in the more cartoony one, the membrane is that big piece of Swiss cheese, right? So this is the membrane right here. It's a phospholipid bilayer representing a phospholipid bilayer. Um, and its permeability is based on size. So the little things like the purple balls can go through, the little green circles can go through, the little yellow circles can go through, um, but the large red blood cells cannot, and the large blue circles cannot. They're too big. So if we look at the things on this side of the membrane, they are different than what was able to make it over to that side of the membrane, and it's based on size. Um, phospholipid bilayers are kind of like that in their selectivity, they usually do not let large molecules go through, just really small ones. But in addition to the size filter, like a colander, like a strainer, when you strain out your noodles and the water goes through, but the noodles stay in the strainer, that's kind of the size relationship for this selective permeability. But there's also um, some polarity characteristics. So when we take a look at things that are small, right, so small, substances, things that are nonpolar. That's huge. So small, nonpolar things are able to freely diffuse through the phospholipid bilayer. And things like oxygen, carbon dioxide, a little bit of water, but remember water is water and the middle of the phospholipid bilayer is hydrophobic. So just a tiny little bit of water can sneak through, not a big movement. Um, so small, and hydrophobic, small and nonpolar, small and uncharged. Those are all of the characteristics of things that can freely move through the phospholipid bilayer. That's a huge characteristic. We need to start learning that and learning that really well. In this other column, we have large things, just like in our Swiss cheese example over on the left-hand side, large substances cannot make it through. The, those phospholipids are very tight and we can't just come bursting through being a huge protein or something. Also, polar and water soluble, those kind of go hand in hand. If you're polar, you're gonna be water soluble. So those kind of things for this nature can be interchangeable. Um, or if you have a charge on them, right? So ions, anything that has a little plus or a little minus on that um, and water. Water is polar. That's the nature of a water molecule. And they have glucose as an example. Glucose is large and polar, so it kind of checks a couple of those boxes. So if you have any of those characteristics, you cannot make it through the membrane. You will be repelled by that hydrophobic middle part. You're going to be repelled if you're polar, you're going to be repelled if you're water, and you're going to be repelled if you're large. So I like to use the saying, if you're large and in charge, 
or large with a charge, you cannot diffuse directly through the plasma membrane. You have to have help. Um, and we're gonna call that facilitated diffusion a little bit later down the line. So this is just a slide to illustrate the concept of selective permeability. The phospholipid bilayer is selectively permeable based on the characteristics of the substances that needs to go through. So if you're small and nonpolar or hydrophobic or lipid soluble, all of those terms can be kind of interchangeable, you can go directly through the plasma membrane. If you are large, if you're charged, if you're polar, if you're water soluble, then you cannot go directly through the plasma membrane. You're gonna need one of those transport channels, one of those helpers to allow you to sneak through and enter or leave the cell because you can't go directly through the plasma membrane. All right, so that's this idea of selectively permeable. The next concept we have to understand is what's called a concentration gradient. The idea, or, or how do we know which direction things are gonna go into? So if we have a, um, some substances on the inside or the outside of the membrane, how are we going to know, um, will they move into or will they move out of the cell? And this is this idea of the concept of um, concentration gradients. All right, so I'm using this as kind of like a whiteboard. I'm gonna, I just have a touch screen, so I'm gonna be kind of doing some writing up here on the screen to help um, explain this concept of concentration gradients. Um, and you have some diagrams and stuff in your book to help you with that, um, like on page 116, kind of showing the molecules of um, dye in a beaker, and you might see an activity or do an activity sub similar at home um, in your lab. So let's say you have a whole bunch of circles. These could be molecules, these could be people, these could be bugs, these could be, you know, just things. And you have that, they're all kind of all clustered together. And then you have over here, my computer's not liking me drawing these little circles. So let's say you have this many over on that side, and actually I'm going to erase one. There you go. So let's say this is our situation. Do we have a difference between this situation and this situation in the context of concentration? Yes, we do. We have a high concentration over here. There's a whole bunch of blue circles crowded together and we have a low concentration over here. So when you have a difference between two amounts of things, this is what we call a concentration gradient they are not equal. If I were to add or subtract on the other side, but I'm already adding here. So if I were to add about the same number of molecules, now if we were to take a look at these, do we have a difference? And no, not really. I didn't count, but they look, you know, just kind of standing back, it looks like they're about the same. So when you have two things that are equal on both sides, we was, is, we don't have a gradient, we know concentration gradient, and this is in what we call equilibrium. So when we are talking about plasma membranes, we have to understand that there is going to be a barrier. You're going to have a membrane that's going to separate two compartments, and whether it's the inside of the cell and the outside of the cell, or whether it's the inside of the nucleus and the cytoplasm, or maybe inside the mitochondria and outside of the mitochondria, you're gonna have a barrier. So let's say this is inside and this is outside, whatever that happens to be. Inside of the cell, outside of the cell, inside of the nucleus, outside of the nucleus, inside of the mitochondria, outside of the mitochondria. You just have two compartments. And so let's say I have some substances. Let's see if X, yeah, X's are a lot easier to draw. Um, so let's make some X's over here. And let's make a few X's out here. So we have a lot more of this molecule inside of the cell than we do outside of the cell. Do we have a concentration gradient? Yes, we do, because we're not in equilibrium. Now, before we can say if this molecule is going to be able to move, we have to say that it is polar or nonpolar, right? Because we just said the membrane is selectively permeable. So if we want to make this an easily movable ion or easily movable atom or substance, we need to say that X is small and nonpolar. So if it's small and nonpolar, it can diffuse directly through the plasma membrane. So now we need to determine which direction it's going to go. In passive transport, remember passive is no energy required, molecules like to go from an area of high concentration. Sorry, my doorbell just rang, you probably heard that. <laughs> 
Um, all right, so let's get back to it. So if we're going to go passively from an area of high concentration to low concentration, we should see that these molecules want to move in this direction. And that's what they'll do. This is our passive transport. It's called simple diffusion. And what will happen is these X molecules will move across the membrane because they're small and nonpolar until we reach an equilibrium, right? So if this molecule moves over and this molecule moves over and this molecule moves over and we'll just erase that one to make it equal. So now that we have about the same number of molecules on both sides, we are equilibrium and we have no directionality. The molecules will continue to move equally in both directions and we are at equilibrium. And then once you reach equilibrium, diffusion no longer happens because you, diffusion is the, defined by substances moving from an area of high concentration to low concentration until you reach equilibrium. Now, if you're at equilibrium, you're at equilibrium. There, there's no gradient anymore. There's no built-in directionality that these substances are going to want to go. So this is the idea behind diffusion. This is the idea behind osmosis. Substances like to go from an area of high concentration to low concentration, so that's their concentration gradient, um, and they will continue to move until you reach equilibrium. Okay? So let us do take a look here. So what if we had some yellow molecules on this side of the membrane? kind of like our reds, right? So we have a whole bunch of yellow on one side and a whole bunch of, um, or just a little bit of yellow on the other side. I know the yellow is a little bit hard to see. So now let's take a look at the purple molecule here. And let's identify our molecules. So we'll say that the yellow X is small and nonpolar and the purple circle is large and polar. So first of all, let's take a look. The yellow, is there a concentration gradient? Yes. So is it going to want to move? Yes. And can it? Yes, because it's small and nonpolar, and the yellow will continue to move down its concentration gradient until it reach, reaches an equilibrium. Okay, so that's true for the yellow. Now, does purple come into play at all in the movement of yellow? Not in this case, they're completely independent. And, okay, so we're done with yellow. Yellow is gonna move until it reaches an equilibrium. The purple circles, first of all, um, will they move even if they were able to? They won't, because they're at equilibrium. They have four on one side and four on the other. Um, but they can't even if they wanted to move because they are large and polar, so they wouldn't be able to move. So even if I were to add a whole lot more purple molecules on one side of the membrane, they'd want to go, they'd want to move in this direction, but they can't because they're large and polar. So they're stuck, they're stuck on the outside of the cell, even though the inside of the cell, ha there's a concentration gradient. So what do you think we could do to make the membrane permeable to the large purple circles. What do you think? Well, we could insert a channel. I can't erase. Let me see if I can erase that. I don't think I can. Nope, I knew it. Let's get my membrane back up. If we were to insert one of those carrier or um, the carrier proteins or the channel proteins, then we could allow the purple to go through. So then the purple circles could go down their concentration gradient until they reach equilibrium through this channel. So what I've done here on this whiteboard, basically, kind of like my drawing board, is I've illustrated concentration gradient, I've illustrated simple diffusion, and I've illustrated facilitated diffusion. All right, so now let's take a look at some of the pictures from the book and see if we can apply that to kind of what you're gonna be seeing in your text. All right, so I have a little video. It's gonna run through once because the way that I do this, I can't restart that. If you'll notice, we had an animation where all of the purple circles were on the left um, and fewer circles were on the right and it diffused through the membrane until it reached equilibrium. So here we have just some pictorial representations of the same things. Um, in both this 
um, illustration here and this illustration here, we're showing simple diffusion, substances moving directly through the phospholipid bilayer, which means they have to be um, lipid soluble or, and small in size. Down here in the beakers, this is just showing you the basic difference between a concentration gradient. So we have a whole bunch of dye molecules here, and we have no dye molecules over here. We have a whole bunch of dye molecules here, and we have no dye molecules here. And so diffusion is going to want those molecules. They just, that's this universal law, things trying to create an equilibrium of moving into that space until after enough time goes by, all of the molecules will be equally distributed between the water and you won't have a gradient anymore. Okay, so that's the idea of diffusion, things going from a high concentration to a low concentration until equilibrium is reached. And then simple diffusion is substances are going directly through the plasma membrane. Facilitated diffusion, they are going to need a transport channel and I'll, we'll see that after the osmosis. All right, um, so our next idea is the idea of osmosis. So osmosis is the diffusion of water. So it's a very specific type of diffusion and it's a diffusion of water through a selectively permeable membrane, again, until equilibrium is reached. And so we can think of it the same way as we did with diffusion. If you have a gradient of water, higher water on one side, lower water on the other, you will have um, a gradient that the water molecules are gonna wanna go from high to low. Um, if you don't have a gradient, then water molecules will, will move evenly and you're not going to have a difference in movement of water. So in these two examples, they're just kind of showing the same idea of um, this experiment. The one on the left is what's in your textbook and the one on the right is just another example. So in this picture here on the left, um, we have pure water. So that's this stuff right here, H2O, pure water. And over here we have, we'll just say salt water, right? It's water with solute. So we're taking a zoom in look here down at this little inset. So the orange line is representing our selectively permeable membrane. It's selective in that the salt can't go through this large molecule of solute, the red, it's too big, but the water molecules can. And so membranes can allow water to go through minimally or with aquaporin a lot more rapidly. And so even though there's a gradient and the solute wants to go from the high concentration to the low concentration, it can't, right? We see those little red arrows that it's like, nah, you can't go, you gotta stay on that one side, but water can freely move. So if we look to the concentration of water, we have way more water on this side and less water on this side. So water is going to want to have a net movement in this direction because we're going from a high water to a low water concentration. And that pressure, the force of that water moving into that other side, trying to create an equilibrium would actually cause water to go up in this U-shaped tube. And so in this other picture, it's prevented here and the picture that's in your textbook, but we can see the same thing. We have higher water over here moving to a lower water. So water will actually move in this tube and push against gravity, the force of gravity wanting to keep the water into that tube. Um, it will actually move until it reaches an equilibrium, the same concentration, molecules, solute per solution until that reaches equilibrium. All right, so this is the idea of osmosis. Water moving down its concentration gradient through a semi-permeable membrane until equilibrium is reached. Now, when we put this piston in here, over here in this picture that's coming from your textbook, it is like a sensor or this pressure that's preventing water moving and that can be measured. And this is what we call osmotic pressure. So osmotic pressure is the force of resistance of water moving into a particular area. So the stronger the push of water into an area, the higher the osmotic pressures. That will come into play as we take a look at some other concepts. Um, so the next topic to take a look at with osis is tonicity. Um, so tonicity is specifically having to do with cells. So cells react to um, watery conditions and solute concentration conditions depending on their characteristic and how it compares to the environment that are, is around them. So let's start with the first term over here on the left. 
This is called isotonic. So in an isotonic situation, you have the same amount of solute and the same amount of water concentration on both sides of the membrane. So if we were to draw that here, right, so here's my membrane, and let's say I have my solute molecules, and I have my water molecules, and everybody's the same. Um, and we'll say the membrane is impermeable to the solute, right? These large green circles that cannot move. And so in my drawing, it would be the red, uh, or sorry, the yellow X's. So water will move equally in both directions. And so this is what we call isotonic. Iso meaning the same tonicity as this osmotic pressure. So here they show you some examples of red blood cells. So um, in blood that has the same tonicity the blood cell that has the same tonicity as the, the solution around it, you weren't going to have any change. And so this is our isotonic concentration. Our human blood um, has a concentration of about 0.9% solute. Um, it's a little bit less than 1%. So our red blood cells inside, and not just our red blood cells, all of our cells inside would be about the same because we want to be isotonic. We don't want to have a big concentration difference between the inside and the outside of our cells because that can be really bad. And as we'll see, what can happen if we change that characteristic? All right, so let's take a look at the second example here. We'll draw our membrane. We'll draw our molecules, we're doing hypertonic. So let's say we have our solution here. This would be on the outside of the cell. So my little red, uh, yellow X's are representing the green circles. And so this is the inside of the cell. And then I got to get my little water molecules. So when we have something like this, first of all, do we have concentration gradients? Yes, we do. We have concentration gradients in both the um, solute and we have concentration gradients in the water. Now we mentioned that the, the solute is impermeable, so that can't move. So that's just gonna have to stay but water can. So in this scenario, water being able to move through the membrane, which direction is water going to want to go? And so we'll label this is the inside and this is the outside. Okay. So in this case, water wants to go from an area of high water concentration to an area of low water concentration. So in this case, the inside of the cell will be losing water. And so that's what we see in this little cell is all shriveled up. It's this red blood cell has been put into a salty solution um, and it's losing water. And this is what we call hypertonic. So a hyper, hyper meaning a lot, like hyperactive, um, hyperthermia. So hypertonic is a solution that has a higher solute concentration than another solution. So in this case, the outside of the cell was hypertonic because it had a whole lot more solutes and water's trying to move to try to create an equilibrium and it's moving outside of the cell and that's what causes the cell to shrivel up. Now that would be like if we were to drink a whole bunch of salt water. We would never want to do that because then we'd be bathing all of our 0.9% cells in say a 5% solute concentration and all the water in our cells would just kind of osmose out trying to create an equilibrium with that 5% salt and we could die. That's why you don't drink ocean water, which is about 3.5% salt water. All right, so in our next scenario, right? So in our next scenario, we have the inside of the cell Okay, and we have the outside of the cell. And then let's fill in all of our little water molecules. So in this case, again, we do have a gradient with both the solute and the water, the solvent. Um, so, but our solute is impermeable, so the X's can't go anywhere, but our water can. So in this case, where is the water going to want to go? It's going to go from the area of high water to low water, and it's gonna actually wanna go into the cell. So in this case, when the cells are put into an environment where they have less solute than what's inside of them, 
they will take on the water. The water is going to want to move until it creates an equilibrium with the salty environment on the inside. And this is called hypotonic, hypo meaning less. So hypothermia, you can think of that. So water will move from the area of more water to the more salty inside of the cell. Now these terms can be tricky for students because you're, you have a hard time deciding which direction it's going to go. Um, a good clue that I will share with you um, and we see this term, we'll see it again in anatomy physiology, if you take that again, or sometimes in microbiology, is water follows salt, okay? So wherever you are solute, it doesn't always, it could be sugar. So wherever you have this higher solute concentration, water will follow that. So water goes towards hypertonic. So if you remember that, water goes towards hypertonic. So if the hypertonic situation is inside, if it's more solute concentration inside, the water is going to go into the cell. If it's more hypertonic outside of the cell, water will go outside of the cell. So you either will shrivel because you're losing water to a hypertonic environment, or you're gonna swell because you're gaining water because you are hypertonic to a hypotonic environment. So make sure you do some practice problems on this because um, that concept can be a little bit challenging um, for students. And isotonic's an easy one because isotonic things are moving um, equally and you don't have any difference be seen between both sides. All right. Okay, the last little bit is wanting to uh, just repeat again some facilitated diffusion ideas. So in simple diffusion, like our purple circles over here, they are, they are small and uh, non-polar. So lipid soluble, they can just go directly through down their concentration gradient, still passive transport from high to low concentration. Um, in these other two examples, facilitated diffusion, showing that um, our channel protein, this orange, can go from its high to low concentration through the channel, or the blue circles going from high to low, but one of those carrier proteins that changes shape. Okay. When we take a look at rates, like how quickly can things diffuse? So you'll be doing or seeing maybe Stephen or Gary doing some lab activities with um, temperature and diffusion through some semi-permeable membrane. I'm guessing, I don't know, that's what we would have done in class. So I think they're gonna try to recreate that the best they can. So if you have simple diffusion where you just are based on the concentration gradient, you will have a continuous slope. So if you increase the solute concentration, you will increase the rate of transport because your only uh, limiting factor is the concentration. But when you have facilitated diffusion, you have some limitations. And so what you'll see is you'll see a really rapid, as you increase the solute concentration, you'll see a really rapid increase in the diffusion rate, but eventually you'll see it kind of flatten off. And the reason why is because you're limited by those membrane channels. If you have five channels in a membrane and all five are, are, are in the process of transporting something, no matter, you could add 5,000 more molecules and you can't make it go any faster if you only have five channels embedded in your membrane. So when you see a curve like this that kind of goes up fast and then it levels off, it's because your membrane channels are in the process of transporting. You could bulk up and increase your concentration gradients as much as you want way out here, and the rate is still gonna be about the same because you are limited by your number of channels. Um, all right, so that wraps up our lecture on passive transport. I will see you in the next one for active transport. Bye.